Good evening from Los Angeles. Former Vice President Dick Cheney's memoir, In My Time, went on sale today. In the book, Cheney expresses no regrets for the actions the Bush administration took following September 11th, including authorizing the use of waterboarding. Cheney writes, the program was safe, legal, and effective. It provided intelligence that enabled us to prevent attacks and save American lives. Cheney did an interview with the Today Show this morning. Matt Lauer used the perfect frame for the waterboarding question. If an American citizen were to be taken into captivity in Iran, for example, and the government of Iran were to look at that person and say, we think you're a spy for the U.S. or you're here to carry out a covert operation, would it be okay for the Iranian government to waterboard that American citizen? Well, we, uh, we probably would object to it. Uh, on the grounds of, that it's torture? On the grounds that we have obligations towards our citizens and uh, that we do everything we can to protect our citizens. Matt Lauer continued to press the point, and Cheney was incapable of answering the question, if waterboarding is not torture, is it okay for other countries to do it? So why was it okay for us to use what most people would say was torture against terror suspects? Well, remember, first of all, these were not American citizens. We weren't dealing with American citizens in the enhanced interrogation program. Secondly, it was people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. There were a handful, two or three, for example, that actually got waterboarded. Third, we had good reason to believe they had information that we could only get from them and that they knew more than anybody else. But if the government of Iran were to capture someone and say, we have reason to believe that you're a spy or you're carrying out a, a, an operation that could be damaging to our country, would you object or would you say they did what they had to do to get the information they needed at the time? Well, I think we would object because we wouldn't expect an American citizen to be uh, operating that way. On the Bush administration's decision to invade Iraq, Cheney writes, when we looked around the world in those first months after 9-11, there was no place more likely to be a nexus between terrorism and WMD capability than Saddam Hussein's Iraq, with the benefit of hindsight, even taking into account that some of the intelligence we received was wrong, that assessment still holds true. The security of our nation and of our friends and allies required that we act, and so we did. Joining me now, former Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell and current Professor of Government at William & Mary, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson. Thanks for joining me tonight, Colonel. Thanks for having me, Lawrence. Colonel, that seems like a redefined threshold for why we invaded Iraq, because as Cheney says, it was more likely to be a nexus of terrorism and uh, a, a dictator capable of doing something with weapons of mass destruction. Uh, that is not the way he talked ramping up to that invasion. Well, that's not the reason at all, either. The reason it was, it was that it was a low-hanging fruit. We went to the Pentagon before Donald Rumsfeld cut us off from the Pentagon, we being the policy planning staff at State. I led the effort, and we talked with the Pentagon uh, on a number of items, and we talked about what would become the axis of evil. We all agreed, the Pentagon agreed, State agreed, I think the entire bureaucracy with regard to national security agreed, North Korea was the number one threat. And Iran was a close second in terms of terrorism. Iraq came in third or fourth, uh, third if you're going to count the axis of evil as being three. Uh, so it was low-hanging fruit. We had seen the first Gulf War. We knew that the onslaught in Iraq would be short and sweet and we'd win. We didn't think at all about the aftermath, though, obviously. And so that's the reason we picked it. So Cheney's just putting forth a preposterous position with regard to Iraq. Let's listen to what Cheney had to say when Matt Lauer asked whether the Iraq war was worth trillions of dollars in taxpayer money and the lives of 4,477 American soldiers. Given the fact that it severely damaged our reputation around the world and there were no stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction, you still think it's worth it? Oh, sure. I, I don't um, think that it damaged our reputation around the world. I just don't believe that. I think you know, the, the critics here at home want to argue that. But uh, in fact, I think it was sound policy that uh, dealt with a very serious problem and that eliminated Saddam Hussein from uh, uh, from the kind of problem he presented before. One, what would have happened this week if Muammar Gaddafi had still been in power with a nuclear weapon in Libya? Would he have fled? I doubt it. 
what did I just hear there? How did he just slide from Saddam Hussein to Gaddafi uh, without anything in between there? Suggesting what? That Saddam Hussein, if he stayed in power, was going to get a nuclear weapon and hand it to Gaddafi and Gaddafi could use it last week? Favorite Dick Cheney tactic, change the subject. His philosophy is you get to ask the questions, I get to pick the answers. And lots of times there's hardly any logic to it, but his answers are the type that appeal to the cheerleaders that he has in this country uh, amongst the neoconservatives and others who uh, disturbingly, in my mind, continue to show that they're in favor of torture, they're in favor of anything that'll protect their security. We, we're no longer, uh, at least in part, a nation of Patrick Henry's who say, give me liberty or give me death. We have a lot of people out there who say, protect my life at any cost, including my civil liberties and torturing other people to do so. Yeah, he, uh, you can ask him a question, and he will say words after the question, but that doesn't mean you're getting an answer. Uh, Absolutely. Let's, li <laughs> let, let's listen to what Matt Lauer asked Cheney about a portion of his book in which he criticizes your former boss, uh, former Secretary of State Colin Powell. One of your most pointed criticisms about him is this, quote, time and again I heard that he was opposed to the war in Iraq. Indeed, I continue to hear it today, but never once in any meeting did I hear him voice objection. In an interview this weekend, I think you now know that Colin Powell insists that he told the president about his objections to the war in Iraq. And in his memoir, President Bush specifically says that he knew about Colin Powell's reservation. So why are you barking up this tree? Well, I uh, wrote the events uh, as I participated in them. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if you look, for example, at my, uh, my uh, comments about General Powell, uh, I've got three chapters on my time as Secretary of Defense, basically all very positive on General Powell. But a balanced account, uh, I think, also required me to put down what my opinion was, and that's what I've done. Now, when historians write books, they're always aware of what other historians have written before them. They always acknowledge it where necessary. I think the first book that entered our history in this territory is Bob Woodward's, where he has a very lengthy and detailed account of, as you know, uh, Colin Powell's meeting with the president that Cheney was not present for, in which Colin Powell made all of the points about why you'd want to be very careful uh, about going into Iraq and maybe choose not to do it. Uh, and here's Cheney pretending that that sort of thing never happened. And also, the fact I, is it worked. We learned valuable, valuable information from that process and we kept the country safe for over seven years. Sorry, Colonel, uh, we, we put the wrong yeah. videotape in there. Go ahead with your response to uh, what I, we're I was just going to say that, uh, I mean, Dick Cheney didn't go to New York and give the presentation on 5 February 2003. Colin Powell did. So if Colin Powell was uh, uh, an opponent to the war, as Cheney seems to say in his book, or didn't express his opposition to the war, or was someone who was undermining the president's positions outside the government, uh, he certainly didn't show it when he went to New York and gave that presentation on 5 February 2003. And uh, that's a moment that he said publicly he'll be remembered for for the rest of his life. Uh, we essentially presented uh, in key areas some false information. We didn't know it was false. We've been vouchsafed that information by the DCI, George Tennant, and his deputy, John McLaughlin. But nonetheless, uh, we wound up presenting some false information about Iraq's status with regard to WMD. Uh, on Secretary of State uh, Powell's presentation at the United Nations in February, Cheney actually writes, when it turned out that much of what Powell said about weapons of mass destruction was wrong, I think embarrassment caused him and those around him to lash out at others. Scooter Libby seemed to be a particular target of their ire. They excoriated the material that uh, that he and the National Security Council staff has provided, while at the same time boasting that they had thrown it in the garbage. As it happened, much of what they discarded focused on Saddam's ties to terror and human rights violations charges that would stand the test of time. He's talking about you there, Colonel. What do, you, me, what do you make of that? Let me give you the facts there. On the very first day that Colin Powell handed me the script done by Scooter Libby and John Hanna from Vice President Cheney's office, it was all about WMD. Nothing about human rights, nothing about terrorism. The terrorism portion was to come later from Phil Mudd at CIA, George Tenet's man, and the human rights portion came from the State Department. 
We threw out Scooter Libby and John Hanna's vice president backed script the very first day at Langley because George Tennant and I agreed it was bull. And we went straight to the October 2002 National Intelligence Estimate, and from that point on, that became the basis of our presentation. Unfortunately, it was wrong in key areas also, but we threw the script out in the beginning, and we didn't badmouth anybody about it. We simply got to work using Tenet's NIE as the support for our work. And Cheney has not given up on insisting that there was indeed a connection between al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. In the book, he says, the terrorism experts would make their judgments about a connection between Saddam and al-Qaeda, but then to satisfy the regional analysts, a higher up at the agency would intone that Saddam had no authority, direction, or control. The phrase turned out to be handy for administration critics because it seemed to say that Saddam had no responsibility for terrorism while we were asserting he did. We had the facts on our side. He harbored terrorists and he sponsored them. What's your reaction to that, Colonel? Well, unfortunately, the vice president sticks to that even to this day, as you pointed out, and he was saying it during the time. I've since discovered, for example, in the summer of 2002, some of the enhanced interrogation was being used not to gain information about a possible another a terrorist attack on the United States, but to confirm these very ties between Baghdad and al-Qaeda. And the reason the Secretary of State did not throw the entire portion on terrorist contacts out of his script for the 5 February presentation was simply that once he decided to do that and had told me he was going to do that, about an hour or so later, George Tenet shows up with this bombshell that they just interrogated a high-level al-Qaeda operative who'd reveal contacts, significant contacts. So Secretary Powell put it back in, somewhat reluctantly, but we put it back in. Only later did we learn that that information was gained through torture and that it was recanted by the individual who was tortured and that the DIA had issued a defense intelligence agency, had issued a dissent within a week or two. We were never shown the dissent, nor told that the high-level al-Qaeda operative had, had recanted, nor told that it was done outside the United States, principally in Egypt. Well, let's hope that no one makes the mistake of putting the Cheney book on the history shelf in our libraries. I think Colonel it'll Lawrence go on Wilkerson. The, I think it'll go in the crime section. <laughs> Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, Chief of Staff to former Secretary of State Colin Powell, thank you very much for your invaluable perspective tonight. Thanks for having me, Lawrence. Coming up, we'll examine Dick Cheney's version of the dramatic night when members of the Bush administration rushed to the bedside of then Attorney General John Ashcroft to get him to renew the terrorist surveillance program.